Hey, y'all. I have two stories for you today, both from Asheville, North Carolina. Let's chat about Highland Hospital, a famous psychiatric facility, and its most famous patient, Zelda Fitzgerald, as well as the Pink Lady of the Grove Park Inn. I'm Candace, and I'll be your guide. In 1909, Dr. Robert Carroll moved his renowned psychiatric hospital, Dr. Carroll's Sanatorium, from downtown to the historic Monfort District of Asheville, North Carolina. The sanatorium prospered, and three years later, Dr. Carroll had acquired the building next door and renamed the facility Highland Hospital. Highland Hospital was unique for its time as the concept of mental health treatment was fledgling. This was the age of asylums, and commonly mental illness was seen as something hopeless to contain, rather than something that needed treatment, care, and rehabilitation. So, psychiatric hospitals as a whole were a new concept then. Dr. Carroll believed that mental illness was best treated by diet, exercise, and fresh air. It sounds like an appealing concept, and versus the option of asylum it was, but his system was very regimented. Carroll believed that self-reflection was contraindicated to recovery, so patients were largely not given enough free time for their mind to wander. They began each day with a carefully scheduled plan for certain sports and physical activities laid out at certain times of day. With a vast array of activities like volleyball, horseback riding, music, reading, parlor games, tennis, calisthenics, fishing, camping, climbing, medicine ball training, etc., they were definitely kept occupied. Nancy Milford, in her biography, Zelda, had this to say about the prominent role of exercise. Quote, An example of Carroll's system was his belief in the benefits of an exercise he had devised, which involved climbing up a hill. The patient was to climb a particular distance up and down the hill so many times each day. Each individual had a certain level of achievement determined for him by the doctor. This was not hiking, nor was it supposed to be a particularly enjoyable exercise. It was to teach the disturbed to overcome obstacles by learning perseverance. A nurse who was at the hospital at that time said the exercise was to, quote, accustom the patient to the reality of endeavor, endless and routine. The monotonous plodding along of everyday life might be a sound analogy, unquote. In addition to the arduous physical training regimen, there were a number of frightening medical treatments administered to the patients of Highland Hospital. Some straight-up bizarre, such as the administration of horse blood to the spinal column, and some chilling, like insulin shock therapy. In the 1930s, it was discovered that schizophrenia patients were unsurprisingly very pliable when their blood sugars were at near-coma levels. Insulin shock therapy consists of administering high doses of insulin, between 100 units to sometimes as much as 450 units of insulin six days a week. The large doses of insulin would drop their blood sugars low enough to place the patient into a coma, usually causing seizures to occur simultaneously. Some psychiatrists felt that the seizures were therapeutic. Obviously, this was a very dangerous treatment intentionally subjecting patients to a hypoglycemic coma, and required a medical staff member to carefully attend to them to prevent death. The nurse would monitor the patient throughout the approximately hour-long comatose state before administering IV glucose in effort to reverse the comatose state. When this worked, it is said the patients had fewer symptoms of schizophrenia upon awakening and fewer troublesome behaviors. When this failed, however, some patients died, which is exactly what you can expect when held at the brink of death intentionally for up to an hour. As if this treatment weren't archaic enough, electroshock therapy was often used hand-in-hand, and while the patients were under their hypoglycemic coma, they were also subjected to electrocutions. So you have schizophrenic patients being pushed to the brink of death with insulin, seizing, and being electrocuted six days a week and being forced to follow a rigid schedule of exercise at other times. And all of this was still preferable to the idea of asylum at that time. This treatment was seen as more humane than what had been available up until this point. After about 50 to 60 comas, 
or when the doctor felt the therapeutic benefit had been received, the insulin doses were tapered off. Treatment courses of insulin shock therapy range from two months to as long as two years. Thankfully, insulin shock therapy fell out of favor in the 1950s with the development of new antipsychotic drugs and barbiturates. Not so much because the new drugs available were more effective, but because they were more affordable than continuing the staph-intensive insulin therapy. The Revere of Highland Hospital drew in some notable customers over the years. Both James Taylor and Patsy Cline were reported to have had stays there, but the most famous patient of Highland Hospital was Zelda Fitzgerald, wife of Great Gatsby author F. Scott Fitzgerald. Zelda was a novelist, painter, and socialite known as the original flapper. Scott and Zelda were well known for their wild parties and drunken antics, and both had very big personalities that led to clashes in their marriage. One stumbling point between the famous couple was Scott's alcoholism. As Scott put it, quote, Perhaps 50% of our friends and relatives would tell you in all honest conviction that my drinking drove Zelda insane. The other half would assure you that her insanity drove me to drink. Unquote. The two fed off of each other, perpetuating a toxic cycle that negatively affected Zelda's mental health as a diagnosed schizophrenic person. F. Scott Fitzgerald spent his days writing, while Zelda strived to become a professional ballet dancer, often practicing up to eight hours a day. Her husband, family, and friends felt like it was a wasted effort, as she was not young enough to become established in the career. When given the opportunity in 1929 to study in a famous Italian ballet school, however, she ultimately declined their offer. As Scott was busy writing throughout the day, he saw every interaction with Zelda as an interruption to his work. She decided to remedy this by becoming an author herself and published Save Me the Waltz in 1932. When Scott read her novel, he was outraged to see parallels between the two main characters and his own marriage to Zelda. He was so angry about this, he began berating her in writing and threatened to write a competing novel, and in 1934 released Tender is the Night. His novel featured an alcoholic man and his difficulty being with his wife, who was succumbing to mental illness. Scott's novel was a success, while Zelda's sold very few copies. He was also accused at times of stealing his wife's writings and publishing them as his own. After the failure of her novel and the success of her husband's, Zelda spent the 1930s in and out of psychiatric hospitals, most of those years spent at Highland Hospital, where she resided on the upper floor for the most intensive patients. While there, she took up painting as passionately as she had practiced ballet. During her time at Highland, Scott stayed at the nearby Grove Park Inn, riding and drinking all day and partying with the it crowd at night. It didn't help Zelda's mental state that Scott was a known philanderer, which helped to feed her paranoia. While she was hospitalized, he felt increasing pressure under the weight of her hospital bills and their daughter's boarding school expenses. He solved this by jumping at the chance to go back to Hollywood to work for MGM Studios for $1,000 a month. This was early into Zelda's first stay at Highland, and she quickly learned that Scott was having an affair with a movie and gossip columnist, Sheila Graham. This affair lasted for two years. One of the biggest rifts between Scott and Zelda is when she accused her husband of having a homosexual affair with Ernest Hemingway and publicly belittled him with homophobic slurs. Scott was so angry at the accusation that he bought condoms and decided to visit a prostitute to prove his heterosexuality. There is no evidence that either of the men were gay, but when Zelda found the condoms, it caused a lingering anger and jealousy that the two never recovered from. After this, while at a party, Zelda felt Scott was spending too much time talking to Isadora Duncan, and she, feeling ignored, threw herself down a marble staircase to get his attention. This is fitting with her reputation for craving attention to excess. In 1940, while apart from one another, F. Scott Fitzgerald passed away of heart complications. 
Three years later, Zelda returned to Highland Hospital for what turned out to be a five-year stay. At the beginning of March 1948, doctors decided she was well enough to be released from the hospital. However, she decided to stay a few more weeks to make sure she was truly doing well enough to leave. This proved to be a very fateful decision. On March 10th, 1948, Zelda Fitzgerald and eight other women were scheduled for electroshock therapy, and hence locked in their rooms on the upper floors awaiting treatment. A fire broke out on the main floor of the hospital and rapidly spread. The wooden fire escapes burned to ash quickly in the blaze. The dumbwaiter shaft, which should have been lined in metal sheeting, was instead lined with plaster, allowing the flames to rush up to the second floor. Firefighters attempted to rescue the nine women, but the various devices designed to contain the women to their rooms prevented rescue. Heavily screened porches and windows, shackled with chains, all made it difficult for rescuers to gain entry. All nine women succumbed to the fire that night. Later, Zelda was only identified through dental records and what remained of one red leather slipper. She was known to wear red leather ballet-style slippers throughout her time at Highland. There are conflicting accounts of how the fire started, and no true cause was ever determined. Some sources say an electric coffee urn on a table ignited. At a coroner's inquest hearing, nurse Doris Jane Anderson stated that she walked into the kitchen about 11.35 p.m. to find the table ablaze and looking similar to a fiery circus hoop for animals to jump through. When asked why she didn't try to extinguish the fire, she explained that she had never witnessed a quote-unquote destroying fire before. Testimony at the same inquest also reflected that Zelda and four other women had been given strong sedatives that night to induce sleep. Yet another of Dr. Robert Carroll's controversial practices was the hiring of former patients to staff the facilities. One such former patient was night shift supervisor Willie May Hall. It is said that Willie made rounds, systematically giving double doses of sedatives to the patients she disliked, before locking their doors and setting the fire in the kitchen. Author Sally Klein, while doing research for her biography, Zelda Fitzgerald, Her Voice in Paradise, discovered evidence that Willie May Hall walked into the police headquarters the night of the fire, and stated she may have said it. No arson charges were ever filed against Willie May or anyone else, but reports indicate she was subsequently hospitalized to Grace and Mental Hospital in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. In the end, it was determined that the fire was caused by negligence of some sort, but not apparent culpability. While in Asheville a couple weeks ago, I took a ghost tour of the area, where I heard another story of the fire secondhand, and without any sources backing it up, so please take that as you will. They stated a woman in her 80s became tearful during the tour and explained that she was there the night of the fire. It was her very first nursing shift after completing nursing school. The woman explained that all nine women who died in the fire were all bound by leather restraints and tied to their beds. The hospital, of course, never admitted this, but the woman swears that is exactly what happened. She stated she could hear the women's screams of pain and terror stop one by one in the night. Following the fire, people in the Montford area began to have strange, unexplained experiences. Occasionally, screams can be heard, with no obvious explanation. While out for a walk, people sometimes report seeing Zelda there, in the flesh, out for a walk herself, carrying a paintbrush and wearing her signature red leather slippers. One former employee of Highland Hospital ran into an apparition of Zelda while out for a walk, and she looked at him as if trying to remember his name before disappearing gradually from the head down, the last to disappear being those red slippers. One woman tells her story of encountering a potential Highland spirit. Quote, I was working in an old building in Montford one day. While on the second floor, I was about halfway up a flight of stairs with my back turned to the bottom. There's a door that splits the stairs in half so you can't see all the way up. 
Mind you, I'm the only person on this floor right now, alone. Next thing I know, the hairs on my neck are standing up, and I hear someone run up the steps behind me and fast. So I quickly turn around and no one is there, just me. I found out later that Mrs. Zelda Fitzgerald had died on the second floor of Highland Hospital due to a fire, and this building was built on top of that same land. Not only that, but the elevator lights weren't working. When I went to the basement, I was compelled to utter the phrase, Wow, a lot of people are down here. It just came out of my mouth. I was by myself. No one else was down there. Unquote. The James Edwin Rumbaugh House next door to Highland was purchased in 1952 and used as an administrative building until later becoming a diagnostic laboratory. It is said that many things go awry at this building. Papers are often shoved off of desks, furniture is tipped over, and generally speaking, items don't stay in place, particularly on the top floor. Currently, the former Highland Hospital grounds are in use as a recovery home for teenage boys, known as Montford Hall. During my research for this episode, I stumbled across a discussion among former patients of Highland who were hospitalized there in the 1970s, at the time known as Brower Hall. Among the several comments I found from former patients, they all unanimously said that their period of hospitalization was traumatic and that they are, quote-unquote, haunted by their time spent there. Another common thread is that they were hospitalized for what they state was just typical teenage troublemaking. For instance, one teenage girl was dating a young man who was just a little older than her at the time. While the more alarming treatments, like the insulin shock treatment that I talked about, were no longer in use in the 1970s, many of these teens were subjected to electroshock therapy as patients there. Sadly, I didn't see a single mention that the time spent there was rehabilitative for anyone. The history of Highland Hospital is a sad one, with a tragic ending. Let's hope those spirits who still remain on the grounds can eventually find peace. That was the story of Highland Hospital. Now let's move to the Pink Lady of the Grove Park Inn. In the early 1900s, malaria was still very much an issue in the American South. Edwin Wiley Grove, a chemist, invented Grove's Tasteless Chill Tonic, a syrup solution to help mask the bitter taste of the quinine. Quinine was, and still is, the primary treatment for malaria, so in this case, the tasteless aspect was a benefit. Grove was often ill himself, experiencing frequent bouts of bronchitis as well as exhaustion brought on by his busy entrepreneur lifestyle. Due to this, his doctor recommended a visit to Asheville, which was known for its fresh air, rehabilitative atmosphere, and wellness. Edwin Grove was so taken by the area that he decided he wanted to build a hotel with the help of his son-in-law, Fred Loring Seeley. Not only did he want a hotel, but he wanted it to be built entirely out of stone and to open within one year of breaking ground. He succeeded, and one year later, the Grove Park Inn opened its doors to guests. The hotel quickly rose to fame, attracting guests such as George Gershwin, Harry Houdini, Barack Obama, and, of course, F. Scott Fitzgerald. The Grove Park Inn's most famous visitor, however, may be the spirit that they call the Pink Lady. Experiences with the Pink Lady vary, with some seeing a pink mist and others seeing a full-body apparition of a woman in a pink ball gown. The legend says that in the early 1920s, a woman in a pink ball gown plummeted from the fifth floor late at night through the building's open center atrium. Fearing this affecting the hotel's business, It is said that staff were instructed to quickly wrap her in a rug before anyone could take note and dispose of her on hotel property, possibly under the newly developing golf course. There's a lot of speculation on who the pink lady could have been. Some believe she was simply a member of high society who accidentally fell over the railing. One darker possibility is some say she was there to meet her married lover that night and when he ended the affair, she flung herself from the balcony. Darker still is the theory that the Pink Lady was a prostitute 
who revealed to her lover that she was pregnant that night. Her lover in turn pushed her from the balcony. Some rumors state that this lover may have even been Fred Seeley, son-in-law of Edwin Grove, the owner of the Grove Park Inn. Either way, it is said that she never signed in that night and no one knew who she was visiting. There was also an absence of screaming when she fell. Everything was quiet. The spirit of the pink lady is said to love children and shows herself to them most often. When a child has fallen ill while visiting the inn, she is sometimes seen stroking their hands and offering comforting words. In one instance, a doctor who'd been staying at the inn wrote a note at checkout, requesting that staff thank the lady in the pink ball gown. His kids had a great time playing with her during their stay. The Grove Park Inn's bellman, David Burgum, tells his own story. Quote, it was 3 a.m. in front of the fireplace. A lady just showed up. I took a picture. She wasn't there. The next picture, she was there. And then she disappeared. Unquote. The pink lady was said to have been visiting room 545, and many of the sightings focus on that room, or the fifth floor in general. Sometimes men traveling alone will note that someone sits down next to them on the bed in room 545, including seeing the comforter rumple next to them. She is said to be quite a mischievous spirit, sometimes flicking lights on and off on the fifth floor, rearranging objects, and toying with small electronics. Some even say they've been awakened by being tickled on the bottoms of their feet. On New Year's Eve, two staff members saw a young woman wearing a pink party dress standing at the back door. They believed her to be a guest, so they went to open the doors for her, but by the time they got to the door, she was gone. Tracy Johnson Crum, Director of Public Relations for the Grove Park Inn, has her own stories. Quote, It was F. Scott Fitzgerald weekend, which we do in September around his birthday, which is September 24th. The inn sets up a couple of rooms to look the way it would have when Fitzgerald stayed there in 1935 and 1936. I was picking stuff up out of the room and taking down the display. As I backed out, someone put their hand on my lower back and helped me walk out of the room. I turned around to say thank you, assuming it was the elevator operator since the doors are right there. It wasn't like a brush or pressure. It was someone's hand on my back. Unquote. But when Tracy turned around, no one was there. She also recounts another story of going to the restroom at the piano bar inside the Grove Park Inn. They had heavy, weighted toilet paper holders that would cause the paper to tear off at every fourth square. As Tracy reached for the toilet paper, it began to unroll on its own, faster and faster. She ran, terrified, from the restroom. When she returned to the piano bar and told her coworkers what had happened, they brushed it off until she took them to the restroom to show them that the entire roll of toilet paper was unwound onto the floor. Tracy says, quote, Again, it's weighted, so there's no way that it would have just continued to turn of its own momentum. Unquote. The more interesting theory on the identity of the spirit is that some historians believe the pink lady could be Zelda Fitzgerald herself. While her husband, F. Scott Fitzgerald, stayed at the Grove Park Inn during her hospitalization, he was in rooms 441 and 443, so not terribly far from where most of the experiences are focused. It is theorized that perhaps Zelda associated the inn with happier times, and after her death returns there as the Pink Lady, hoping for another social occasion. Whoever the pink lady was, she continues to walk the halls of the Grove Park Inn as a friendly and mischievous spirit 100 years later. Her presence is a fun addition to the history of the inn, at least in the absence of confirmation of a dark backstory and a draw for Taurus. Okay, y'all, that's all for our two stories of the day. Now, let's talk about them. All right, so... The Highland Hospital story was clearly influenced by my recent trip to Asheville and the ghost tour that I took there. The Highland Hospital story was just one that I couldn't pass up. There was so much history there and so much sadness and suffering. It kind of sticks with you. 
It's especially sad that I learned while doing my research for this that Zelda was supposed to be released. She wasn't even supposed to be at the hospital when that fire happened. And speaking of which, why, if she was well enough to go home and just spending a little extra time, why was she getting electroshock therapy that day? That doesn't sound like someone who was well enough to be released or like a hospital that had her best intentions in mind. Another thing that threw me is the fire happened at night. The one nurse who claims that she witnessed the table on fire saw this at like 1135 at night. Why were they locked in their rooms awaiting electroshock therapy at almost midnight? Did they typically do the treatments in the middle of the night? Or was that just an excuse for why the people were locked in their rooms? The story from the ghost tour about the old woman stating that everyone was tied to their beds, it's, you know, it's not verifiable. I couldn't find any sources to back it up. I have no idea if that's true. But I will say if the hospital was doing completely unethical things like dosing them with sedatives or double dosing them to keep them easy to control, it does make sense that they would have done something like using restraints illegally. I don't know, in my mind, it makes perfect sense this area is haunted. A lot of hauntings that happen, happen as a result of traumatic deaths. And if you top that with the traumatic hospitalization and then the struggles with mental illness, the experience is a perfect cocktail for a haunting. But it's just such a sad story. Now, for the pink lady, that's a more fun one. It's not so much tortured souls and more just a a fun spirit who sounds like she's enjoying herself in the afterlife. Of course, I do wish that we knew how she died. That would be nice. I did look into booking room 545 because, you know, that's the weird stuff I'm into. But unfortunately, the hotel said that I couldn't request that room specifically. So it would be a gamble on whether you got the room you wanted or not. The ghost tour that I took did really push the theory that it was Fred Seeley's mistress who was killed that night as the pink lady. Another unverified, sourceless story that I heard from that tour was that his granddaughter or great-granddaughter ended up on the tour one night and saying that the family widely accepts that he was a horrible person who probably did kill his mistress. You know, again, I'm not saying that for truth. I have no idea. That's just what someone said. It's really fascinating to me that historians are making that loop back to Zelda in this story. I guess it shouldn't be a surprise, but it was. And it makes me wonder if Zelda was known to have a pink ball gown or not. Surely someone would be able to figure that out, but I don't know. Anyhow, as always, I want to know what you think. Tell me your thoughts about these stories. You can find me on social media at Obscure Appalachia. Please make sure you check out the Instagram or the Facebook page for photos from today's episode. If you're enjoying these episodes, please subscribe and give me a rating on your podcast provider to help others find the show. Thanks again, y'all. Until next time. 